So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, I, I told Colin Cleary, who's going to moderate here, um, that we were likely to have like church-like attendance, church-like seating. That is, people sit in the back. Um, but you, you know, so please, those of you still walking, come on, come on down here. This, this would be great. And while you are uh, doing that, uh, let me welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. I'm, I'm Bill Taylor. I'm the executive vice president here at the Institute. Um, Institute is, uh, was established by Congress uh, 30 years ago. We're in our fourth decade. Um, we are funded by the Congress. Uh, our mission is to focus on violent conflict and trying to prevent uh, mitigate, resolve, clean up after violent conflict. That's, that's the reason that the Congress uh, established us. Um, we are pleased to be able to have and host uh, these kinds of discussions. Uh, we do work around the world. Uh, we do work in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, uh, I just got back from Kiev, which I will say a little bit about, since one of the topics um, on today's agenda, um, the overall topic, of course, being being corruption and anti-corruption efforts, um, it's inevitable that we uh, will talk about Ukraine in that, uh, in that context, um, which is a good thing. So having just, just gotten back uh, from there, I can say a little bit about that before I turn it over to Colin. Um, let me also recognize uh, the uh, Chairman Emeritus uh, of the USIP board, uh, Robin West. Uh, Robin, thank you very much for being here, who feels very strongly about corruption. Against it, I will, I will tell you. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, and also Colin will introduce the, the panel, but I'm pleased to have uh, Ambassador Bill Brownfield here um, as, uh, as the main speaker and the main motivator, um, driver for this discussion here today. Um, one of Ambassador Brownfield's predecessors never let it go by without complaining to us about this building because Ambassador Brownfield's room, office over in the State Department has a great view of the Potomac River until <laughs> the Institute of Peace was built. And, uh, and so his president, and I'm sure he will have something to say about, uh, about this. He has something to say about a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. It will not be bitter. <laughs> I'm very glad. I'm very glad. We're here to support you, Bill. This is good. Um, let me just say a couple things uh, about Ukraine uh, before I turn it over to Colin, who also knows something about uh, Ukraine. We having served together um, in Kyiv um, in 2006-2009 and, and Colin stayed on. Um, I, as I say, I just got back on Sunday. Um, one of my conclusions from that visit um, is that the success of the Ukrainians and the Europeans um, and the Americans and others um, in halting the Russian aggression against Ukraine um, with sanctions and low oil prices uh, and, and a, please, please come on down, all the way down. We'd love to have you towards the front here. <laughs> Keep coming. Um, but that success at blunting the, the Russian aggression has now given the Ukrainian government, this Ukrainian government, some breathing room, some space um, in order to focus on the real problem that they've got, which is economic growth, economic development, and at the top of that list, the top of economic reform list, is of course corruption. And the range of people that I talked to just last week in Kiev, and we have people on the panel who have spent time there, a lot of time there, uh, can talk about uh, this aspect, but the topic of fighting corruption, um, in particular at the top, but throughout the society, is front and center. So this is a great opportunity today to, uh, to talk about that. But they now have some breathing space to focus on those. Uh, they've got a lot to do. Um, but at least they're not being, the, the Russians are still there, and they still, they're still occupied Crimea. And so I just I want to reassure my Ukrainian friends that we haven't forgotten that. Um, and they still have forces in, the, in Donbass. But they're not losing, they're not, the Russians um, are not still aggressing. And so this gives the opportunity, it gives the new government, the Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk government, an opportunity to clean up their act and to take on this um, anti-corruption work. 
radical transparency is one of the things that I will talk, that I think ought to be on your agenda. Um, every time I go to Kiev um, uh, over the past year, um, I have gone to see a good young friend of mine who has been about uh, eight or nine months ago appointed to be the district chief of Vizhgorod, um, a district um, in the Kiev area, um, just north of, the, of Kiev city. Um, Alex Gorgon is his name, and Alex, when he was appointed the district chief, did, bought two cameras out of his own money, um, and one he has focused on his desk, and the other he has focused on his conference table, which also goes with him when he goes around doing the work of the district chief. He streams online everything he does. So you can go right now. Um, all, those of you who have your computers, you can go online right now um, in Visegrad and see what Alex Gorgon is doing. And if you want to know what he's doing, the next day, every evening, he puts online his entire schedule for the next day, minute by minute. So if, you, if he's going to talk to some businessman or some restaurant owner uh, or some citizen about an issue, you can find out, and you're interested in that, you can find out what time that event is happening. And you can, again, go right on there. Radical transparency. Um, it's also proving to be popular. So there were, there were local elections uh, in, in, uh, in Ukraine in October, last uh, month ago. Um, and Alex Gorgon was trying to build support for other reformists. And he was able to support a, uh, uh, a man who was elected as the district council chairman. So he is now an ally uh, on the district. And the, the mayor of Vizhgorod. Again, on working on a campaign, uh, uh, campaigning on a platform um, of radical transparency and of economic reform. Young man, he was on the Maidan. This is a new Ukraine, and he represents the new Ukraine. Um, last thing I'll say is, uh, I, I was talking to several members of the panel, um, uh, a person that I met while I was there in, in Kiev in 2006, 2009, um, did work in the government. He worked uh, for President Yushchenko. Uh, he then left the government um, and has formed his own NGO that does, among other things, anti-corruption work. And he had a great metaphor um, I thought that I would share with you, and that is, uh, I was asking about who are your allies, Oleg? Who, who are, who other, what other people are there who are trying to take on this corruption issue? Um, and I named a couple people, and he said, well, they're pretty good, these guys are not so good, um, but well, one, of the, one of the cabinet members, very good, but, he said, to, sh to show the importance of systemic change, um, he said, you can take a fresh cucumber and put it in a barrel of pickles, and it's a matter of time. So that is, the, is an indication of the importance of a systemic change, not just changing one or two, not just putting a person in, but it's, it's, a, it's important to change that whole barrel. Um, you got to get there. So, um, Colin, let me hand this to you. Um, I look forward to this discussion. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming, and welcome again to the Institute of Peace. Thank you, Ambassador Taylor. Uh, my name is Colin Cleary. I'm a State Department fellow here at US, USIP. And it's my pleasure to join Ambassador Taylor in welcoming you all uh, on the occasion of United Nations uh, designated International Anti-Corruption Day. And I think it's very fitting that we tie in, as Ambassador Taylor did, the Ukraine case. And uh, we heard um, uh, the Vice President Biden was in Kyiv just this week and gave a historic uh, speech to the Ukrainian parliament. And the bulk of that speech was dedicated to the issue of this conference, which is the urgency of anti-corruption efforts and the, and the threat that, any, that corruption poses to national security and international security. And Ukraine is a, a perfect case for that, and so we're delighted to have a panelist here who will address that case and other panelists who will look at the issue more broadly. And with that in mind, it's my honor to introduce our first panelist, William Brownfield. He is the Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, which is colloquially, colloquially known as Drugs and Thugs. He was uh, sworn in as Assistant Secretary uh, in, uh, five years ago, in January 2011. As Assistant Secretary for the INL Bureau, which is, as it's called, he is responsible for State Department programs combating illicit drugs and organized crime, as well as support for law enforcement and rule of law. 
INL currently manages a portfolio of more than $4 billion in more than 80 countries and administered by 5,000 employees and contractors. Ambassador Brownfields uh, has an, a very long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service, which includes uh, service as ambassador not once, twice, but three times to Colombia, Venezuela, and to Chile. He is, uh, holds the personal rank of career ambassador, which is the most senior rank in the Foreign Service. And last but not least, he is a native of Texas. So, Ambassador Brownfield. Nothing least about that point <laughs> whatsoever. Dr. Cleary, uh, Madam Kalenyuk, uh, Madam Anderson, Mr. Cohen, Ambassador Taylor, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the day after International Anti-Corruption Day, which obviously was yesterday. I mention that because it gives some focus and attention uh, even a certain logic to, to, to today's panel and uh, today's uh, um, discussions uh, here at the United States Institute for Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been said before, but that's no reason not to say it again. There is no greater corrosive threat to democracy and prosperity throughout the human race than corruption. It kills investment, it lowers economic growth, it increases the costs to the economy and to governments everywhere that it exists. It also sucks up as much as two trillion, that to be repeated is two trillion dollars a year, larger than all but the two largest national economies in the world, lost to the effects of corruption. It weakens institutions, it hollows out democracy. It turns people in mass against their own governments. And in fact, you might ask yourself, who in the world might conceivably support corruption? And I give you two people who do. Organized crime and terrorist organizations. They love corruption. It is the fuel for what they do for a living every day. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the year 2015. We have not just this year discovered the perils and dangers of corruption. In fact, even more, we have a pretty clear idea of how we, as the international community of nations, can and should deal with this global threat. First, we build international integrity standards, standards that all nations, all communities can agree that we are trying to apply in our nations, in our business communities, in our societies. And we find them inscribed in documents such as the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and other UN conventions, in certain domestic legislation such as, for example, the United States Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and its counterparts spread through many different nations around the world, by institutions such as the international financial communities governing institution, the Financial Action Task Force, an entity created and designed to apply sanctions to those financial communities that engage in corruption, 
and entities within international civil society, NGOs such as Transparency International, build international integrity standards. The second principle that we have learned over the last 40 years, wait for it, implement those standards. It is one thing to write them down on a sheet of paper, and it is another to get governments, institutions, businesses, and community leaders to apply those standards. Now, we do this not just by naming and shaming, although I have no objection to that, but we also do it through technical assistance and technical procedures that forces certain things into open and transparent visibility that previously were done behind closed doors. We do it partly through capacity building, making institutions capable of doing and performing their mission in a transparent and non-corrupt manner. And we do it partly by enabling and strengthening civil society and those parts of civil society that are ready to take on the anti-corruption mission. And the third principle, ladies and gentlemen, is build political will. Because, as everyone in this room knows, you may have the strongest possible standards, and you may push for implementation as hard as you can if there is no political will within governments, within community leadership, you are not going to succeed. Let me take a country as an example. It is the Republic of Ukraine. Dr. Cleary, could you shoot me the first photograph of only two that I promised to show you? What you see up there, ladies and gentlemen, is one view of what corruption looks like. This was a photograph taken, I believe, several weeks, perhaps a couple of months, before what came to be known as the Maidan Revolution. Those are citizens of Ukraine. Notice where their right hands are. They are symbolically, and these were some among thousands and thousands that were doing this at this time, not only protesting what they saw as a highly corrupt government that was leading their nation, but were trying to use a certain amount of irony as in signaling, oh, we can't believe what is going on. There are a billion other photographs of corruption. I like this one because it's a nifty contrast with the next one, which is what does an effort to combat corruption look like? May I have that one, Dr. C? What you see there, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you precisely when that photograph was taken. It was taken mid-morning on the 4th of July, 2015. This is a small segment of about 100 of what was in fact 4,000 members of the new patrol police of Ukraine who gathered in, in Kyiv's uh, central square to be sworn into office by the president of Ukraine. What this photograph does not show is the totality of the 4,000 officers and the thousands of family and common citizens who came out that day to actually express some hope that as they place their right hands, not over their heads in frustration, but over their hearts as they took their oaths, that these men and women, 35% women, were in fact going to represent a new Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, Transparency International, in the months before the Maidan, revolution, if I may use that word, 
assessed that Ukraine ranked number 142 out of 175 nations measured in the world in terms of corruption. They ranked Ukraine 134 out of 142 ranked nations on lack of judicial independence. The year before the Maidan, two thirds of the citizens of Ukraine in surveys assessed their government as not just corrupt, but ineffective. And one third acknowledged to having personally paid a bribe in the preceding year. And at the Maidan, as the distinguished lady seated to my left would probably say, at the cost of 100 lives, the people of Ukraine stood up and said, enough, we want change. Now, some of that change since then, ladies and gentlemen, has been technical in nature and by no means insignificant. The implementation of an online property registration system so that you now register your property in a manner that is transparent because you must do it online. Or a government contract procurement system that is now done online so that things that previously could be done behind closed doors must now be done in public. Or no, new rules in terms of disclosure for campaign finance and media ownership. These are technical solutions, ladies and gentlemen, and they are good solutions. They contribute to the ultimate solution. But at the end of the day, the solution to corruption is not just technical, it is also in the institutions themselves. Their strength, their ability to perform their missions in a transparent and non-corrupt manner. And if I may be allowed ever so briefly and in a very un-Texan like manner to toot my own horn, I will tell you that I am extremely proud of the $25 million which my part of the State Department, the INL Bureau, has spent on this project over the last 18 months in Ukraine. May I say now for the record, it may be the best $25 million that the American people have ever spent on any foreign assistance program since the dawn of time, or at least since the year 1776, I suppose when we would date our birth as a nation. I am proud of our efforts to train and equip the Ukrainian Border Guard Service. I acknowledge that obviously much of that was related to Ukraine's ability to defend its own sovereignty from external threat and aggression. But ladies and gentlemen, let's not kid ourselves. Transparency starts at the border. If you enter a country in a manner that is not transparent and in fact is subject to corruption and bribes, you can assume that as those humans work their way deeper into the country, they're going to bring that experience with them. I am proud of our role in recruiting, vetting, training, and equipping a new national patrol police force, which you see in the lower photograph behind me. A completely new force. The concept of the government was eliminate the existing police force and replace them from scratch, building up from point zero. The four largest cities in Ukraine now have completely new patrol police, and the surveys suggest that their population, their, their popularity rating right now is clipping along somewhere around 85%. 
that would be about the same level that most of us would assess mom and apple pie. I actually don't like apple pie, but to put it in some perspective for you, that's about where you would be in the United States to get an 85% approval rating. I am proud of our support for a new Inspector General's office in the Ministry of Interior. I am proud of our support for an NGO vetting center that will vet all police, all law enforcement officers and personnel throughout the government of Ukraine. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, to have an impact on corruption throughout a nation, you must have an impact on the criminal justice sector of that nation. There is today a new inspector general in the prosecutor general's office, that office responsible for prosecuting all criminal cases in Ukraine. There is today in fact, after some confusion over the last two days, uh, an anti-corruption prosecutor in the PGO. There is today a National Anti-Corruption Bureau in the city of, or the oblast, or region of Odessa. There is a now not so new anti-corruption team focused on addressing corruption throughout the Odessa Oblast. There is an e-procurement system for jobs, for purchases, for contracts in Odessa, which we very much hope will migrate to other parts of the Republic. There, is, there are grants provided by INL to several civil society organizations to monitor these efforts, report on them, and offer recommendations for greater solutions as the government of Ukraine advances in its reform efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude with a stupid but nevertheless truthful statement. Anti-corruption is not a 100-meter sprint, it is a marathon. But unlike most marathons, it does require some quick and visible victories. It needs those victories in order to motivate the, re the reformers themselves and to maintain the support of the people. I unless I am corrected by the distinguished lady to my left, feel some sense of optimism and progress in the Ukrainian context. I would say by way of closing comment that I agree with those who say not in our lifetimes and perhaps not in the lifetimes of the next 20 generations are we going to see in the corruption perspective, heaven on earth. I do believe it is realistic to expect in our lifetimes that we could make life a hell on earth for those government officials who engage in corruption. That, Dr. C, is my presentation. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Brownfield. Um, one of the things that gives people hope in Ukraine when they look at the very difficult situation is civil society, because while institutions in Ukraine are weak and have been deeply corrupted, civil society offers a, a, a great hope of a new generation who, who get the points that uh, Ambassador Brownfield uh, outlined. And for that reason, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce our next panelist, Daria Kaleniuk, who embodies uh, really, I think, many of the values that uh, that we would like to see uh, succeed in Ukraine. Ms. Kaleniuk is co-founder and executive director of the Anti-Corruption Action Center, a prominent a local NGO in Ukraine. She's an expert on international legal mechanisms in support of anti-corruption efforts, including issues related to stolen asset recovery and anti-money uh, laundering activities. During the Euromaidan uh, era, she ran the Yanukovych.info campaign aimed at freezing the assets of Yanukovych and his associates that were kept in Western jurisdictions. Uh, and in line with what Ambassador Brownfield said, the, the Anti-Corruption Center 
is currently implementing an INL grant to assist the National Anti-Corruption Bureau in selecting, vetting, and training new detectives and analysts, as well as in monitoring the overall activities of the new bureau. And so with that, I give you Daria Kaliniuk. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, Ambassador Brunfield, it's an honor to speak after you. Uh, and it's quite symbolic that uh, in the Institute of Peace, um, I will be talking about war. Uh, it's clearly that the war on the East in Ukraine depends a lot what will happen in the war with corruption in Ukraine. And I believe that if we are successful in war with corruption, the situation on the East will be resolved faster and with less damages um, and with less life lost. So where we are now in the war with corruption in Ukraine? I would say that there are two parallel sub-wars going on there, and the one we already won. This is the war on access to information, which we won, and another one where we are still fighting uh, and where the fight is very tough and where the um, uh, risk is very high. And this other war is the war for independent law enforcement agencies. Ambassador Brownfield already told about transparency and about Ambassador Taylor told uh, a lot about that as well. But Ukraine now, um, in a year and a half after Euromaidan, turned um, into the heaven for investigative journalism. We have so much open information about who owns what and how public finances are being spent in Ukraine that any other country in Europe has. And I believe the country as the United States doesn't have as well. So we have first in Europe a public registry of beneficial ownership of companies. We have opened registry of owners of immovable property where you can go online, you can put the address of the building and see who owns that building. Uh, we have extended the information accessible about the companies. You can go online, put the name of the person, and you see how many and what are the companies associated with this person, and what is the history of these companies. On public procurement, we, om we opened almost everything we could, um, including the uh, bidding documents for, um, for uh, com competitors who bid in the public procurement. Uh, we are now about, there is already a law, and we are about to implement the law and asset declarations, which will be available online and uh, which we could compare. And all that together, and there, will, there is land conductor, so you put the land and you see who owns the land, and we already have a law on, um, on ownership of cars. So you go online, you put the name of the person, and you see how many cars and what size um, uh, he or she owns. Why all that information is important? Um, a civil society really plays a strong role in Ukraine. And um, the intolerance to corruption is raising too high. Uh, people are willing uh, and um, people are demanding government to fight corruption, but people also feel that they want uh, to do something and they are ready to take responsibility for anti-corruption. And all these in, uh, information available is practical, are practical tools for um, activists all across the country, for journalists, uh, for lawyers to use to spot corruption, reveal corruption and report about corruption. Um, paradoxically, but I don't think that it would help Ukraine in the TI uh, corruption rating uh, because we have now more information about corruption, right? Uh, we have at least four investigative TV channel programs uh, which are released every week, which report at least three cases of corruption. And they reveal um, state officials, prosecutors, judges, parliamentarians, ministers, deputy ministers who are engaged in corruption. They report facts based on that information which is accessible online. However, the problem is that it's been reported in media, uh, people are mad about all their facts, but nothing happens on the law enforcement side. There is still flourishing impunity, and people who 
have, who have possessed very top high positions in Ukraine, and especially in law enforcement, they are not prosecuted, and they are not, the assets which are taken through illegal means are not confiscated. And this is a very big problem. Even those Yanukovych guys on whom we did investigations during Euromaidan and on whom there were assets imposed by the EU and by the Americans, um, sanctions imposed, they are not prosecuted yet in Ukraine. There is any single case of conviction of a former Yanukovych era official who would rob the country into the percentage of GDP. And this is a very big problem. So, uh, and here, there is still fight. Uh, here we are, our model of change is that it is impossible to reform what doesn't exist. So, if we are talking about impunity, we should have independent law enforcement, right? We should have independent prosecution, we should have independent judiciary to investigate corruption and to put people into the jail. However, in Ukraine prosecution service, which we inherited from the Soviet era, was used for decades to cover all this grand political corruption. Uh, to, it was and still remains as a supermarket uh, where you can buy cases, you can pay a bribe to trigger the case, and you can pay a bribe to close the case against your competitor, political, business competitor, um, to close the case which is, was brought against you. So all that is still thriving in Ukraine, unfortunately. And it's been for uh, decades where leadership of Ukraine would be pleased with such kind of system. As if a president has control of a prosecutor's office, he has control, he has a powerful tool in negotiations with oligarchs, in negotiations with political opponents, and, but, but it's, it's not a democracy. And it's not a fight with corruption. So, um, right after Euromaidan, uh, our organization, and gently with many other NGOs, we, were, we, we got together immediately and we thought, okay, we have this window of opportunities to change some laws, uh, to change some systems, institutions. Um, we have very limited resources. We understand that this new leadership might not be willing to really do the reforms and change the country. What should we focus on? And we decided that let us better focus on building newly from scratch parallel structures in law enforcement. And here emerged the idea of National Anti-Corruption Bureau, the separate agency with strong guarantees of independence, which has criminal investigation powers, and which has very narrow focus on precisely crimes of corruption, and precisely of, on crimes of corruption conducted by senior state officials. Therefore, for a year almost, gently with support of the uh, US, of IMF, of the EU, of the World Bank, we were fighting for the strong law which would guarantee all these um, um, tools of independence of the agency, and which would guarantee open competitive processes of selecting new people. So we knew and, and, and we still believe that people make the changes. And if we create lifts and entrances for new people um, out of the system who have um, um, common values, uh, who have intolerance to corruption, who want to destroy the very corrupt system, if we create entrances for them, uh, this will be the best investment. Uh, so, a year ago, we um, advocated successfully for good laws, and now for about a year, we are trying to implement these laws. <coughs> and unfortunately, Ukrainian government doesn't want the change in law enforcement, particularly. Especially in, in those law enforcement which has power, like prosecution. Uh, we were... Um, uh, in a very strong contradiction with the president of Ukraine when we were um, protecting publicly the competition for the independent director of National Anti-Corruption Bureau. The president wanted to have a person loyal to him. Uh, we kind of won that, that battle. Uh, the uh, new director is now hiring and already hired first 
uh, 70 detectives through the open procedure. And we as, um, as civil society, um, our organization is member of the Council of Civil Control. According to the law, uh, we are members of the selection committees which select detectives. So uh, in, in summer for, for three weeks, uh, I was interviewing about 200 people for the detectives. With the support of INL, we uh, arranged um, uh, broadcasting of these interviews so that it would be open process. We, ha we had camera. Uh, we did search in all of these public registries um, information about all candidates. So if there would be some, some, something suspicious about the candidate, we wouldn't select him. Uh, we, also con um, we, we also agreed with the NABU director that there should be polygraph tests, uh, not uh, obligatory for um, taking person in or not, but obligatory to have additional eye on, on, on some persons uh, which, um, which test not well on polygraph. So we support a final, we did this polygraph testing as well. And um, we helped to train them as well. And um, all trainers which we engaged, and there are many of them, Ukrainians, they told that they are quite impressed with the selection. So these are kind of new people which give hope. Uh, then this is the second battle was the battle for anti-corruption prosecutor who would be doing this prosecutorial oversight over the detectives and with, with, with presence of whom actually the agency is fully fledged uh, and agency can start criminal investigation. And it's, it was very tough. Uh, on, on our side, on the side of civil society, we're fighting um, uh, US, IMF, the EU, all key donors of Ukraine who give funding and who want to support uh, Ukrainian uh, efforts for the reform. They were pointing out that for us, they told, it's important to have independent agency and independent people there head in these agencies. Um, it was not that easy. I will not go into the details, probably if there will be questions. Um, but uh, from, from the part of civil society, we did a few street direct action events, attracting attention of all the uh, people in Ukraine to this issue. It's a complicated issue to understand, right, for an average person. Prosecution, anti-corruption prosecutor, selection commission of anti-corruption prosecutor, it's hard to understand. But we explained the simple messages, why it is important, we explained with simple messages why the independent members of the Selection Commission are important. And we, sh we, we had a very laser attention to uh, all this process of the society. And again, uh, the president wanted to have a very loyal person. The president has very loyal German prosecutor. And he wanted to have a very loyal anti-corruption prosecutor. Uh, the obvious person for whom president would vote for and would support, didn't win the competition. Unfortunately, the strong person uh, whom we would support the most and who has track record of uh, investigation of corrup corruption didn't win uh, the competition. So we have kind of reached the compromise. And um, there is a young 31-year-old anti-corruption prosecutor had in the office. Um, it's not the end, we understand. It's the beginning of a long-run race. Uh, but again, we will continue to have our focus on, on these agencies and on the processes which allow new people to enter these agencies. So our next step, what to do next, would be to monitor every single step of National Anti-Corruption Bureau and Anti-Corruption Prosecutor, to monitor investigations of journalists, and when we spot legal facts, which can trigger investigation, to send it as a applications of crime to anti-corruption uh, bureau, and um, yeah, so this is this is our plan for, for for the next year, and I'm I'm happy that for for the U.S. it's also uh, it's also um, important focus. Um, what else I would say? Um, the, the 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 very important message, all that positive changes, which are not that many, there could be much more. Um, they happened not because of the leadership of president or the le leadership of prime minister or the leadership of the majority in parliament. They uh, happened only because there was joint synergy between civil society in Ukraine. By civil society, I mean organ civil organizations, activists, and media. 
and international partners of Ukraine. Once again, US, IMF, EU, World Bank. So if there is a joint message delivered by all these players, both non-publicly and publicly, it has power. And it is kind of a very huge leverage and a very powerful argument for Ukrainian senior officials to actually to do some change. And it is important for us to coordinate these messages. If we are civil society um, would be alone without any support of internationals, we would never convince our parliament and our president and our prime minister to do even 5% of what was achieved. And it is important to continue that synergy uh, because it really can give the results. Another thing that what I wanted to add, and I'm about to finish, um, it was the International Anti-Corruption Day yesterday. And the United Nations Convention Against Corruption um, is international, powerful international legal tool uh, which can be used on practical cases. Um, the U.S. Um, laws, uh, like USA Patriot Act, uh, which gives lots of um, uh, additional powers to prevent abuse of U.S. financial institutions from corrupt money, uh, is for us was kind of um, the last hope uh, when we had Yanukovych regime. When we understood that we can't reach and kind of, when we understood that there is impunity in Ukraine and law enforcement will never touch those on the top um, um, officers, we approached foreign jurisdictions. We approached the EU member states where law enforcement work and we approached the US where law enforcement work. And we used international anti-money laundering standards as an argument to convince the member states of the EU to convince the US to freeze assets which are of suspicious origin. And there are a lot of such assets um, laundered from Ukraine and countries as Ukraine to the Western states. And for, for, for us, for countries which are developing, it is probably the last hope. And it's very important, even if the assets are frozen, or um, even if for a corrupt official it's um, more complicated to launder funds, um, to open a bank, foreign bank account, to set up foreign uh, company, um, he loses the feeling of impunity. He understands that if he or she is untouchable in a country like Ukraine, he or she will be and could be investigated and prosecuted outside of countries right, like Ukraine. So um, um, I met yesterday with, with DOJ people and FBI people, and um, they continue to do sort of investigations of, um, uh, of corruption, which is laundered through Western uh, financial um, jurisdictions and uh, through Western institutions. And we have a few already interesting cases in, 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 in the US where investigations was, was triggered abroad. So for us, it is um, a tool to uh, shake the system and to pressure the system. And um, just, just an example, uh, the current member of parliament, the head of the uh, Committee on Energy, was investi is investigated by Switzerland and by the Czech Republic. And based on this investigation, which became public in Ukraine, um, this member of parliament um, at least told last week that he will resign from his position. Unfortunately, he's not prosecuted yet by Ukrainian, very corrupt prosecutor general, <clears throat> but at least he resigned. Under Yanukovych, it wouldn't be possible. Without Switzerland, investigation in Switzerland, it wouldn't be possible. So here I will end up uh, and um, can talk for long if you have any particular specific questions would be happy to reply and the US help for us, the INL help for us is very important and we are happy that you are focused on law enforcement and you are focused on this issue of impunity. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dara. And we will save some time at, uh, for questions uh, afterwards. Um, so we'll, our next panelist is Elizabeth Anderson, who is the director of the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. She's been in that position since September of 2014, but has more than 20 years of experience in international law, international human rights, and rule of law development. She previously served for eight years as executive director and executive vice president of the American Society of International Law. Uh, she is an expert in international human rights, international humanitarian law, and international criminal law, and has taught these subjects as an adjunct professor at American University um, College of Law. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And I have a PowerPoint. I don't know yes, who is in control of that. You are. <laughs> the right button. The, the right button, button will make it appear. Arrow. Good luck yeah. to you. Wow. Impressive. Um, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to join the panel and this effort to rally the world against corruption. It's a critically important project. Uh, the ABA Rule of Law Initiative works on a broad range of rule of law problems in over 50 countries around the world. But I have to say, the thread that runs through all of that work is a fight against corruption. Almost all of our other rule of law efforts um, require a focused attention on the cancer of corruption. So I think this is a very important topic, and I'm, I'm really privileged to join this panel. The work that we do is in close uh, collaboration and with generous support from INL in many countries, and we're very grateful to that. And critically important also is partnership with justice sector actors, and particularly civil society in all of the countries where we are working. And so it's um, particularly a pleasure to join uh, with Ambassador Brownfield and Ms. Uh, Kaleniak in this discussion. Uh, I'm going to widen our focus a bit, um, talk a little bit about Ukraine, but more broadly about the trends that we see in the anti-corruption field, offer some examples of programming that we see making a difference, and some takeaways for our future work together. I am going to give you a relatively optimistic take. Um, it's my nature. I'm kind of a glass half full gal. Uh, I think you have to be to be in the rule of law field. Um, but I want to uh, uh, also hasten to say that this is not entirely a good news story. It's a good news, bad news story. I will start with the bad news. Um, and take that bitter p pill uh, quickly. Uh, fortunately, uh, Ambassador Brownfield in particular uh, has already flagged a lot of the bad news here. And, and that is that much of the progress we are making on anti-corruption is a function of the stakes. The import of this problem and the growing realization among politicians, policymakers, business, and civil society across a wide spectrum of industries, fields, and interests that the costs of corruption are simply intolerable. And corruption is undermining all of the other things that we care about and that we are working on, whether it's combating crime, working on advancing uh, environmental uh, interests, um, and uh, advancing peace. And it's important that we are here at the U.S. Institute of Peace because corruption is really a major driver of conflict and undermines efforts to build peace wherever uh, we see it. So that's the bad news. Got that out of the way. Let's move to the good news. The good news um, is, as Ambassador Brownfield mentioned, we have important new tools and norms at our disposal. And this is the effort of, of many in the international community over a couple of decades to really develop a, an infrastructure of international norms that is quite powerful. Um, these include the UN Convention of, uh, Against Corruption, of course, and all of the tools that it provides. The UN um, Convention Against Corruption review process is now helping us identify and prioritize needed reforms to target specific corruption risks, such as environmental crime or the pilfering of state assets and transnational crime. And the UN Convention Against Corruption, together with other uh, international tools, the Financial um, Assets um, uh, Action Task Force, uh, gives us powerful anti-money laundering systems to dis detect and disrupt corruption 
to recover looted assets, and importantly, stigmatizing tools such as the um, FATF blacklist, which are making the costs of corruption um, much more uh, uh, obvious to uh, a, a lot of actors and creating important political will to tackle the problem. We also uh, benefit from U.S. leadership in, in the enforcement effort, in particular the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and similar uh, uh, criminalization uh, in, in the U.K. and elsewhere, making bribery to win contracts an intolerable risk for international firms. Regional and multilateral initiatives in the G7, G20, APEC, uh, among those states, we have seen uh, concerted campaigns launched to tackle corruption and associated transnational crimes. An example in the APEC context, with strong U.S. leadership from INL, we have seen an effective multi-year campaign um, in the APEC anti-corruption working, anti working group with Australian and Thai support, hand-in-hand -hand with ABA Rowley's Bangkok-based regional anti-corruption advisor, to make anti-corruption agencies throughout the region realize the power of following the money trail, finding the ultimate controllers and beneficiaries of corruption, and removing their ill-gotten gains. Based on this work, many countries have frozen and recovered hundreds of millions of dollars in proceeds of corruption. And finally, new whistleblower protections here in U.S. law and around the world are helping flush out evidence of corruption. So that is uh, an important set of norms and tools at the international level. Now here are some examples of how um, those tools can be operationalized. As Ambassador Brownfield said, the key is implementation. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of our work in two places. Um, that I think are instructive of the lessons we are learning. First, I'll take you uh, to Moldova. Um, and I want to uh, flag here some top-down efforts, institutional reforms. With INL support, we have taken a multifaceted approach that's having important, albeit stutter step, um, impact. First, we have worked to strengthen the law supporting efforts of the Supreme Court of Justice to better define corruption crimes and articulate common standards and interpretations of the law that have contributed to an increase in convictions. Second, we have provided assistance to the Prosecutor General's Office in improving practice in investigating illicit enrichment that has contributed to the authorities opening two such investigations in the past 18 months. And we are working uh, to train judges, prosecutors, and criminal investigators, leading to nine new cases against corrupt prosecutors and judges, rooting out corruption in the, in the criminal justice system is a high priority. And uh, that is, is starting to see um, some progress. Third, we are providing support for the national anti-corruption body, the Integrity Commission, strengthening its systems for government officials' financial disclosures, bringing that critical transparency. And in turn, then, educating government officials about this tool, these systems, resulting in many filing and refiling their disclosures to enhance transparency. All of this is against a backdrop of a large governmental corruption scandal that has people protesting in the streets underscoring the importance and urgency of this work, and we are hopeful that, gov that the government will continue to press forward on it. My second example is a partnership, uh, again, with INL in Morocco. And it's, I'm not just going to focus on M countries, but these are two M countries. Uh, in Morocco, we have been working closely with INL for 10 years um, to address corruption. And this case re reflects well the changing global environment and the political will that is emerging against that backdrop. Ten years ago when we started, corruption was an unutterable word. It could not be freely addressed. Only one civil society organization was working on it. And the closest that we could get to addressing judicial corruption in Morocco was to talk in vague terms about judicial independence. Today is a very different story. Corruption has made it into the royal discourse. The king has called for measures to address it. Morocco has first created an anti-corruption commission under executive authority, authority, and then in 2011, that became written into the Constitution with uh, new powers. And in February 2015, 
Enabling legislation was passed uh, to transform uh, that into an effective body. A number of questions remain about how it will exercise those powers, but these are certainly positive developments. We are also seeing this effort at uh, combating corruption play out in judicial reform. In a royal commission, the Ministry of Justice underwent a year-long process of studying judicial reform, and the preface of its recommendations state clearly as a number one goal combating corruption. That kind of formal recognition of the problem it was simply unprecedented before this. And now we see this uh, commission recommending a code of judicial ethics and uh, an agenda for reform there that is quite promising. The Morocco case also uh, highlights another important aspect of a successful strategy to combat corruption. And here, uh, Ms. Kaleniak's uh, work is also illustrative. In Morocco, a, a key element of our work, again, with the support of INL and also from the Dutch government, is the emphasis on public outreach and education, working with civil society to create demand, bottom-up demand, to complement that top-down institutional reform. Civil society has been incredibly creative and effective, using a range of tools pictured here, from theater productions, to radio uh, spots and caravan outreach, explaining in accessible terms the complicated issues that Ms. Kaleniak uh, alluded to about effective efforts to combat corruption. This also is a focus of our current work in Ukraine, uh, working with experts in Daria's network and the No Bribery campaign. We are helping civil society educate the public and giving them the legal tools to hold government accountable, to flag any of those police, those newly minted poli police who may stray from the course, it's important that they be held accountable and that um, be righted. And here, uh, civil society is critically valuable. You see in the slide the no briberies online pledges soliciting citizens to commit to paying no bribes. Already more than 3,000 have signed these and the movement is growing. Another example I'm fond of is Bribe Spots work, and you can see their website here, a, a, a vehicle for crowdsourcing instances of, of bribery. Citizens can put in their GPS location of where the, a bribe has been solicited, and we can um, aggregate that data. It informs civil society. It shines the light on corruption. It informs uh, law enforcement and policymakers to root out that cancer. Without this kind of demand, much of our supply side institution building comes to little. Let me leave you with my takeaways and next steps for all of us working to combat corruption. First, after years of norm creating and tool development as Ambassador Brownfield flagged, the focus needs to be on operationalizing these, on implementation. Second, these efforts need to be tailored to each context and target the areas of criminal activity that pose the greatest threats in any different context. Any, uh, context. Third, there is enormous demand and need for technical assistance. We are just finishing the first round of the UNCAC review mechanism, and it is revealing great need for technical assistance, both on UNCAC and on uh, responding to its findings. Countries need help in their self-assessments. There is need for strengthening the peer review process and for civil society shadow reporting to make this process more meaningful and effective. Tying such technical assistance to broader rule of law assistance programming would leverage the expertise and justice sector relationships necessary to make it successful. Fourth, these efforts need to, be, need to support multi-agency, multidisciplinary programs and network these across borders. It's not just one actor that is going to be, make a difference in this. You need government agencies responsible for legislation, for policing, for intelligence, for investigation and prosecution, together with civil society and the private sector, all working together, breaking down barriers and sharing information and intelligence. To pick up Ambassador Brownfield's uh, uh, metaphor of, of the sprint versus the marathon, I think we need to think about some sort of 
more of a team-based uh, idea here, perhaps a relay team, a long ultra marathon uh, relay is what we are about here, but something that will tap all of these different actors and uh, bring them to the effort. Um, I want to end with one cautionary note, and this is appropriate today. Yesterday was International Anti-Corruption Day. Today is International Human Rights Day, the 67th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I want to flag a, a real danger, and that is that as momentum builds behind these efforts, and in particular, civil society becomes more effective in advancing this agenda, we will see, we are seeing a backlash and closing space for civil society in this arena, making anti-corruption groups an important focus for programs such as the President's Stand with Civil Society initiative. That is a big agenda. I look forward to discussing how we can advance it together. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Appreciate it. Um, our final, our cleanup batter is J our USIP's own James Cohen, uh, and he is a program officer for governance, law, and society here at USIP. His work focuses on security, governance, and anti-corruption. He previously worked at Transparency International's UK uh, office uh, involving in uh, security in their security program. Uh, prior to that, he worked at the Geneva Center for Democratic Control of the Armed Forces International Security Sector Advisory Team. Uh, he's also consulted with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. James? Thank you, Colin. <clears throat> and thank you to the panel. This has been uh, an excellent conversation, very insightful. Um, and it's a pleasure to be doing the cleanup batting, as Colin said, and doing a little bit of summarizing. Um, and also going on a bit of a down note after uh, Ms. Anderson's up note. Um, as we've seen, corruption is finally being recognized for its impact on hindering development and driving conflict. In this sense, addressing corruption is specifically a target of the Sustainable uh, Development Goal 16, along with reducing in, uh, illicit financial flows and developing accountable and transparent institutions. While there's debate about how to concretely, concretely measure this goal, it is still a big step that SDG 16 to address corruption, along with other tools like UNCAC, are around. Because we have to remember that not so long ago, corruption was seen as benign or even beneficial to development. It was buttressed by the old phrase, as we've been going through a number of metaphors, corruption greases the wheels of bureaucracy. The problem is, as we've come to see, is that if you grease the wheels of bureaucracy with corruption, you wind up getting grease fires. No country is free from the risk of corruption, but from Ukraine, as we've seen, to Afghanistan, from Nigeria to Iraq, these corruption grease fires, as we can call them, have made themselves known. In Indonesia, we actually see real fires being caused by, uh, through corrupt land deals that made the country more susceptible to weather phenomena. The impact of corruption is often discussed in terms of numbers. As we've uh, heard, as Ambassador Brownfield said, the value, he cited the value annually of all corruption to be $2 trillion. The UN cites developing countries losing $1.26 trillion annually through bribery, tax evasion, and theft. Now, this is in comparison to the $135 billion that were spent on international development in 2011. $1.26 trillion taken compared to $135 billion invested. That's almost 10 times as much taken as put in. Today, though, I want to focus on corruption's impact on governance and the rule of law and how this drives conflict from a USIP perspective. Corruption drives citizen grievance and mistrust towards the state by corroding the rule of law institutions. Corruption compromises the security sector, rendering it unable to respond to threats or making it a threat itself. As Ambassador Brownfield pointed out, finally, corruption enables rule of law spoilers, criminals, terrorists, and kleptocrats to thrive. While the panel was diving into Ukraine cases, and we heard uh, cases from the American Bar Association, I'm going to be looking a little bit at uh, Tunisian Mali as two poignant examples of states that reached a breaking point uh, due to the vicious cycle of the corruption in their system. The outcries of their citizens' grievances became enmeshed with the, and fed into regional insecurity. Governance, governments and citizens are working towards avoiding these breaking points, striving to convert these vicious cycles of corruption into virtuous cycles of accountability and rule of law. 
On corruption undermining the rule of law, citizens are generally aware of the extent of corruption in their countries. Although, as pointed out, they can know about corruption, even though it can be complicated within a context to understand how it works specifically. But they do encounter it on a daily basis through small and large interactions. They know to expect bureaucrats to ask for bribes for basic government services. They see their government officials riding around in fancy cars and living in villas while the promises of foreign aid are yet to be invested. And while the public works within corrupt systems in order to make ends meet, their grievances uh, and a sense of injustice builds. In Tunisia, as an example, entry into the market economy was limited to much of the population under the former President Ben Ali, with his ruling family exercising a heavy hand in controlling the economy. On the surface, ahead of the Arab Spring, Tunisia had good indicators. It had a decent economy, it had good education levels. However, the rigged system of the economy and the repressive authoritarianism that protected that led frustrated Tunisians to peacefully revolt against the old regime. In the case of Mali, although former President Tory were, and Mali were hailed as development darlings by the West for a long time, uh, the explosive rebellion in the North in 2012 demonstrated the level of grievances and marginalization that the population felt and that security personnel felt. Even a sizable proportion of the population was very happy to see President Tory's exit. This was all built on years of resource mismanagement and impunity. As official corruption at the top corrodes ca and captures governance institutions, corruption within law enforcement and the justice system undermines the rule of law in particular. Police become predatory and courts become inaccessible as citizens can't pay uh, the bribes to access courts. Uh, the courts and the police are often perceived to be the two most corrupt institutions around the world in Perception Index. In a recent study by Transparency International and Afrobarometer of 23 sub-Saharan African countries, it was found that 25, over 25% 25 of users of the police and courts had to pay a bribe to access these services. As was the case in Tunisia and Mali, the state loses legit legitimacy as citizens see the face of the rule of law as self-serving. Endemic corruption in both Tunisia and Mali was constructed by governments more interested in self-preservation and less than so in an equitable rule of law. To their own peril and the stability of the West African region of the Maghreb and Sahel, uh, the resentment over corruption was left to simmer until one young man had enough and lit himself on fire and we're still feeling the ramifications of that today. Moving on to the security sector, in addition to creating security threats by undermining governance and building grievances, corruption also compromises the security sector's ability to address threats. The military, police, intelligence, and border guards all face forms of corruption through patronage, the sale of positions, the plundering of salaries, and the plundering of procurement funds. Transparency International's Defense and Security Program, where I worked before, as Colin said, did a study in 2013, recently updated it, but the 2013 study of 82 countries found that 70% of those countries had a high or critical risk of corruption vulnerability. Patronage and, position, and positions for sale enable cycles of corruption where security leadership is primarily concerned with trading favors and uh, for debts for their positions, as many people to move up the ranks had to pay to get up those ranks as opposed to a merit system. This leaves underpaid staff at the front line without proper equipment and leadership prepared to, prepared to or is unmotivated to address threats. This was the case with the confluence of circumstances surrounding Mali's military collapse in 2012. Demobilized soldiers who had their equipment funds uh, pilfered by top brass were up against well-armed and well-motivated rebels coming from the north. The Malian soldiers retreated in frustration, mostly at their own leadership. Mali is an example that demonstrates corruption's ultimate end in undermining the security sector, but run-of-the-mill corruption among police and border guards also undermines security by creating gaps in their ability to detect and stop threats. As Ambassador Brownfield says, corruption starts at the border. Right now in Tunisia, in response to the attacks in Sousse and the Bardo Museum, new uh, construction of barricades along the Libyan border are being set up uh, to prevent terrorist networks from getting in. But all it takes is one or two border guards that have, in, that have corruption within the institution to let low-level smugglers that are allowing terrorists to get through uh, undermine that system. The Kenyan government has, in fact, acknowledged that this problem allows al-Shabaab militants to get from Somalia into Kenya. 
Finally, as we looked at the point of view of citizen grievances as the point of view of undermining security, corruption uh, in, does allow spoilers of the rule of law to thrive. The Sahel and the Maghreb hold pathways for smugglers moving drugs, people, and weapons to West and Central Africa to the Mediterranean. But sophisticated smuggling routes and the cover of, Dever of the desert's open and sparsely populated terrain still require corruption to effectively allow movement. It is in criminal and terrorist networks' interest to undermine governance institutions and create a weak rule of law. Bribes and cuts of the money allow for officials to turn a blind eye or even give these criminal and terrorist organizations cover. The former Malian government played with this dangerous temptation to its own detriment, colluding with organized crime in the north of the country, who wound up working with terrorist organizations during the 2012 insurgency. Corruption also allows the theft of the state and impunity amongst officials that drive citizens to grievances, as Ms. Kliniak has definitely shown with the Ukrainian case. In the Tunisian case, where, we saw, where uh, the Tunisian government and the Ben Ali regime managed to steal millions of dollars through finan global financial systems and opaque banking systems, uh, their assets so far that have been recovered are $80 million US, planes and property, and this is only considered to be the tip of the iceberg. The Tunisian government is growing so frustrated with trying to find these assets that they're now starting to strike amnesty deals with government officials who are stealing these assets before, which is driving new frustrations in the population. In this regard, as it's been pointed out, we need to look at corruption also within a global network, not just within uh, borders. If you've seen the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index map, it will show you deep reds within Africa, Latin America, and Asia, light yellows uh, within Europe, North America, Australia, and this is to show that no country is free from corruption. And this hides and reveals a truth. It reveals a truth that, yes, on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll face corruption in these countries, but it also hides the fact that this money, this $1.26 trillion that's stolen, rarely stays within these countries, as has been pointed out. It moves into uh, offshore islands, into national capitals, into financial centers. So moving from a vicious cycle or a vicious cycle to a virtuous cycle, I'm just going to give a few recommendations on the top of the recommendations that have already been pointed out. At an institutional level, effective and independent oversight is crucial to upholding the rule of law. This includes ensuring oversight bodies have the appropriate mandate, funding, staffing, and legal framework to carry out their jobs. Uh, budget transparency is a further crucial component to accountability, with open uh, data platforms as a positive trend. However, security and defense budgets remain difficult to open. While there is a need for some uh, secrecy, these budgets are often notoriously used for theft uh, due to their lack of public oversight. And it also goes into the point of after military dictatorships, well, they were brutal, but they were efficient and clean. This isn't always the case. as uh, the Pinochet government was found out to have over $20 million in stolen assets overseas after investigations were found, and many other military dictatorships can find that money. Civil society, as we've been pointing out, and citizens at large need to be involved in oversight as well. Citizens resign, uh, resign to believing not much can be done about corruption or only that a fool would stick their neck out, find ways to work within the corrupt system, until a possible breaking point. This is working within the system. It's very different from saying people like corruption, as is sometimes dismissed. Oh, well, corruption is just part of that system. They like it. No, people don't like it. They just find a way to live within it to make ends meet. Civil society needs to help articulate the kind of good governance and rule of law citizens want to create and groundswell to show citizens that accountable governance is possible, as we've been seeing the examples of Ukraine, and especially to explain the complications of corruption, especially in the defense and the security sector, which most people don't understand about uh, defense procurement and issues like offsets within the defense sector. Access to information, additionally, government information needs to be accessible. While open data initiatives are progress, citizens need to be able to use data to make change. Further information for accountability comes from access to information laws and freedom of the press. These tools create a robust oversight system, but are often under threat due to the impact of on corruption networks and authoritarian regimes. There's currently a troubling trend towards 
more laws that are suppressing freedom of the press due to secrecy and due to uh, security concerns. At the global level, the impact of illicit financial flows on the rule of law and security are gaining traction. Governments, governments need to continue to dismantle these tools of illicit networks exploit, such as tax havens and shell companies, without harming beneficial illicit financial flows, such as remittances. And finally, tackling corruption, just like all reform processes, is a political process, as we've heard. Challenging a deeply corrupt system will create powerful losers who will commit human rights violations to hold on to their network. Um, this should not cause avoidance due to sensitivities, but rather it implies a smart and tactful approach to grand corruption. Part of that tactful approach is doing context-specific programming, learning how corruption works within specific contexts, learning how networks work, learning where the sources of corruption are, and learning people's understandings. We can't go in with cookie cutter assumptions of how corruption works within each country. And finally, the vicious cycle of corruption is already undergoing a global change in perception, thankfully. People in other countries saw Tunisians demand something better for, from their government and results for, are waiting to break this cycle until a dangerous point are playing themselves out. Moving to a virtuous cycle of good governance and rule of law helps to avoid a worsening downward cycle of violence. Great. Thank you, James. So that's our, those are our presentations. Um, we are going to now open it up for questions, and we have some microphones uh, coming around. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And uh, please state your name and affiliation. We might start off, I don't know, uh, Ambassador Taylor mentioned Mr. West, a former chairman of the board here. If he, if he had a comment or question, we could start with, with you. If not, we could... Yeah, we, and then we could open up to everybody else. We are pressed for time, but we'll. In other words, keep it, it short. Um, I uh, uh, I think this is terrific, and um, I have nothing to add. You all are the experts. The only thing I would say is that um, I hope that this is the beginning of a process, and that if the Institute of Peace, which is there, are two things. One, it is a very powerful convener in Washington, and if there are other. Uh, parties that can be brought to this and a process put in place. Um, I think we can, I'll talk to the management and see what we can do about that. Um, the second thing is that the Institute of Peace is not a think tank. Think tanks are in the business of generating policy. What the Institute of Peace is trying to figure out, not what to do, but how to do it. And I think that to the extent you all are serious practitioners, and I, I think this is one of, corruption is one of the great evils on earth. Uh, and it affects everything. And uh, so I would encourage you and everybody here, if you can think of ways for the Institute of Peace to be helpful in this process, let us know. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Yes. Uh, uh, with the green scarf there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kay Bateman. I'm at the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, and we are working on, uh, we have a lessons learned program there, and we're working on a, um, a comprehensive report looking at you know, 14 years, the international U.S. project, our intervention in Afghanistan, and looking at anti-corruption and corruption specifically. And so my question to you is, um, is in environments where the U.S. and other donor countries um, have critical security interests, um, we have we often see that counterterrorism or political stability objectives might compete with our longer-term governance goals, including anti-corruption. Um, and how I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on um, on how our decision makers, uh, foreign policy decision makers in the field can balance these, you know, our, our anti-corruption objectives with our, you know, critical security interests, you know, i.e. how do we put pressure on these governments to take anti-corruption, um, to make progress on anti-corruption and yet still maintain access um, to these governments for, to pursue our own security objectives. Thanks. Do I start? I'll start. Um, since obviously I come at this from, in, at least in the, in the Afghanistan perspective, from both directions. Uh, one, I am supporting programs that are designed to have 
specific law enforcement, counter-narcotics, uh, rule of law and justice uh, objectives. Second, I come at the problem uh, with an anti-corruption and transparency perspective. Uh, there's no, as you well know, there's no simple answer to, to your question. Part of the answer is one size does not fit all, and there has to be a different approach to individual countries, societies, and communities based upon the set of concrete realities uh, in which they are operating or dealing. Second, uh, national leadership, or at times global leadership, has to establish what the ultimate priorities are. And there will be times, and you have kind of laid them out already, uh, where, where the national leadership will say, this issue involving security or this issue involving terrorism is the lead priority. It is the reason, the principal reason why we are engaged. And then we must figure how allowing that to be the priority, we try to accomplish other missions. Third, uh, as you no doubt are aware, based upon uh, the, the organization, the entity with which you are affiliated, as we provide assistance, support, cooperation uh, on, uh, on the entire range of issues, we have to take the steps that we can to ensure that that specific cooperation uh, assistance uh, is in fact consistent with desires to reduce and eventually eliminate corruption in the government, in its institutions. Accepting as well that in many countries, such as Afghanistan, the ability to actually monitor, visit, and have direct engagement with your program is limited by the security situation. Uh, that there are large amounts of, say, using the, the Afghan model uh, of the Republic of Afghanistan that for the most part we cannot get to. And yet if we don't have a program that has some impact there, uh, it is going to have, at the end of the day, you're not going to succeed with whatever the national uh, or international leadership has established. That's not a good answer to your question. Uh, I suppose it's a long way of saying uh, you have to allow your national leadership and governments to determine what your priorities are then you try to accomplish those objectives consistent with your anti-corruption objectives and try to, to accomplish what the realities on the ground will allow you. In certain places, such as I would suggest, subject to correction by Ms. Kaleniuk, anti-corruption is the priority. I, I mean, and the national government would say, this is, this is the, the fundamental issue you're trying to address. When that's the case, uh, it is a much easier project to, to kind of take on. If may I continue, um, of course, I don't know the particular case of Afghanistan, but on the example of Ukraine, um, I would say that international financial assistance is very contingent. And we from civil society, right after the crisis, after Euromaidan, we met uh, probably all international assistant um, in organizations who came to consult what to do. And we begged them, please don't give any money until you, they do, until government does, very specific conditions. And these conditions shouldn't be vague. They shouldn't be just fight corruption, reform prosecution. They should be, uh, if, if, if you say that the agency should be independent, you should state what do you mean by that. Selection procedure and the select members of the selection commission should be um, known um, people in the society whom society trusts and who, who are professionals, right? Uh, you, you should put that there should be independent funding guaranteed every um, year by, by, the, by the state. And it should be publicly known. Uh, why it is important? Because we are a civil society. We say, listen guys, if we will not receive the next IMF loan, and for Ukraine it's important now because of the uh, complicated economic situation, the reason why we didn't receive it is just because the president and the government don't want to fight corruption. They just don't want independent national anti-corruption bureau. And again, it is very important to th that um, institutions which have um, both security interests um, and um, reform interests, anti-corruption interests, they work, they coordinate their um, 
uh, messages. Like in Ukraine, the EU has strategic interests, IMF, US have, have interests, and it is crucially important that they do coordinate their messages. If they do not, and we have some sort of bad examples in Ukraine, it turns against civil society. So civil society continues to say, listen, we don't trust that this selection commission independent, but EU comes and say, like Ms. Mogherini comes and say, um, or the president in front of Mogherini says, um, we implemented all the EU requirements, and she is silent. This turns against us because we look like a few crazy idiots saying uh, that we don't, that we think that the president lies. So, I I important to coordinate. Thank you. Maybe I'll get another question. Um, yes, in the brown. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is kind of shifting this conversation about corruption more towards um, Latin America. I mean, right now we see that. Um, Venezuela, each time there seems to be more evidence that it's become kind of like a, a narco state, right? With relatives of the president being involved in drug trafficking and as well as allegations of certain army generals. So I kind of wanted to ask you how, what steps could be taken to combat this? And then on the other hand, we have neighboring Colombia, which is on the verge of signing a peace treaty. And despite it being described in the past as a failed state is now uh, basically moving in a very different path than what Venezuela is. So I was wondering if you guys have anything to say about that. Ambassador Brownfield. <laughs> right. Uh, you're picking on me mostly due to my past, not to my present, but I'll take a quick bite and, and I will offer you this, uh, this set of observations. I've been involved off and on in Latin America now for 36, going on 37 years. I first went to Latin America in official status in 1979. Uh, so I am approaching 37 years. I will say to you with <laughs> uncharacteristic honesty uh, that, that I have never in, in the past one third of a century and more uh, seen the Latin American region more focused on the corruption issue than I do today. For example, the largest country in Latin America is today engaged in a major national self-assessment as to what, and I take no position as to what is true, what is false, what the outcome will be, but, but the extent to which members of the government uh, 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 of, of Brazil were engaged in corrupt activities. Uh, the two of the uh, larger and more important countries of Central America uh, have recently, in the case of Guatemala, gone to the extreme, ladies and gentlemen, of removing their chief of state and head of government because of corruption charges. And in the other case, Honduras have gone to the point where they are attempting to establish a, an internationally supported mechanism through the OAS uh, to perform the anti-corruption mission. You have pointed your finger at two other countries in the South American continent that have pursued this issue in different manners. I prefer not to engage in conversation on both of these uh, in order to avoid becoming part of the discussion, but I would say the very fact that the discussion is occurring shows that this is a matter of considerable importance. I cannot point to a time since 1979 when that many countries in the Latin American region have taken the corruption issue and raised it to such a high level of priority. That would be my response. Well, thank you. I think uh, we, I'm looking at the time here and we've run over our allotted time. So if uh, we want to thank our panel and thank you all for coming today. And perhaps there'd be, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, there might be an opportunity afterwards to engage uh, one of the panel members on, uh, in doing so. So thank you all and thank you to the panel. <laughs>